Welcome to Finding Proof, where we discuss all things early stage VC. We're your hosts, Thanasis and Jenny of the Proof Fund, and our goal is to get to know the best seed and early stage VCs out there. In this episode, we spend some time with Les Craig, who is a partner with Next Frontier Capital, which is a venture capital firm based out of Montana and is looking to fund technology companies within the Rocky Mountain area of the U.S. Les, thank you for joining us today. Excited to hear your story, which is a little bit different since you're literally in the middle of the country. Tell us about Next Frontier Capital and the strategy and how it came about. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you. I'm super, super excited to be here as a guest today and excited to share with everyone a little bit about Next Frontier Capital. So the firm was founded in 2015 and the founding partners really had this vision and this thesis to test out, which was how do you provide access to capital to some of the great early stage tech founders that might be in regions that have historically been overlooked. And specifically for our fund, Will Price, the founding partner of Next Frontier, was in Bozeman, Montana at the time. And what he saw all around him was amazing founders, in some cases founders that had already worked for unicorns, had successful exits that were sort of on their next early stage venture. But the one missing ingredient was venture capital. There was zero venture capital firms in Montana in 2015, if you can believe it. And historically, there had only been about, call it on average, two to $3 million a year invested in Montana companies, early stage tech companies, which put Montana pretty much at 49 or 50th in the nation every year in terms of access to venture capital. And so the, the founding premise was, if there were founders starting venture scalable companies in Montana that had access to that capital, could they get to follow on funding? Could they get to coastal, like a coastal series A? And if that were the case, could they also then get to the exit potential? And so fund one for Next Frontier Capital was really a test of that hypothesis. And the fund was, is a $21 million fund, 10 portfolio companies, very Montana centric, either headquarters or some sort of founder presence in Montana. And it, it really proved that there was something special, I think, to work on in this region, in, in the Northern Rockies. That's kind of blazing a trail, right? If I was looking for a market to go, I wouldn't necessarily go to like the bottom one. Talk to us a little bit about what that was like. I mean, if there's no ecosystem, was it the case that there was no ecosystem? Were there transplants from other regions that wanted to live in Montana because it's a great place to live? How did you get around that issue? Yeah, great question. Well, if you look at the history of Montana, I think there's always been a, mo a motivation of folks either that were born here or raised here or vacationed here as children. And there was always this desire of coming home or get, getting called back to Montana. I mean, frankly, that was my story and, and ultimately led to me moving here and being a place where I wanted to raise my family. But I think what you saw in the early 2000s, and really the, the best example was Right Now Technologies, which was a company founded by uh, our governor, current governor, Greg Gianforte. The company bootstrapped most of the way to a $1.7 billion exit from Oracle. Oracle acquired the company in 2011. And so there was some precedent already. And that also, you know, I would call that the Fairchild Semiconductor, the PayPal of Montana. It was the fractioning of that and the founders that came out of that ecosystem that really became the next generation of Montana tech founders. So there was some good seeds in the ground and I think really they needed the nurturing and watering. When I moved to Montana actually, is a little bit about my story. So I moved here in 2015, which was the same year that Next Frontier Capital raised the first fund. But my job initially was I ran the Blackstone Launchpad, which was early stage programming funded by the Blackstone Charitable Foundation, often in these overlooked but high potential ecosystems. My job was to run that programming and essentially be part of growing and building the ecosystem. I would say even in 2015, it was still very early, but it's still very early today. It was really fun for me to dive in, learn who all the players were, the stakeholders, and really start to try to build some community. And, and that was my entree to working with tech companies in Montana was running that programming. 
I know that you guys have a blog post about the importance of building a great community and the different building blocks that go into that. But how did you personally think through that, as you just mentioned, in terms of building this VC ecosystem from the ground up? The way I kind of approached it was trying to be more of a connector and and more of a facilitator and let the ecosystem evolve organically or naturally. And I think it's like a three-legged stool that you have to really nurture and incubate. And the first thing is you can't have an ecosystem without founders founders, without real founders that are trying to do real things, right? And so the way you, I think, identify that in a place like Bozeman, for instance, is you have to understand what is the sort of cluster of excellence that exists in this ecosystem naturally without forcing it. And certainly there are some great B2B SaaS founders in that space. There was with Montana State University and some of the expertise in LIDAR and photonics and optics. So there was in existence a cluster of excellence and some great founders to begin with. And so that was really just about getting them together and instigating things and making collisions happen. The second leg of the stool is the mentorship piece. And thankfully, Montana is, and is especially, I would say, Bozeman, Big Sky area, is very rich in mentors because it's, it's actually a place where a lot of successful people, successful in tech, successful in finance, I mean, you name it, successful people in general, it's a great place to retire. And so for folks that want to give back and want to give back to this community, it's not hard to find great mentors. But once again, creating the conditions where they'll get involved, where they'll interact, where they'll speak at events. So that, that's once again, the instigation piece. And then the third leg of the stool, I think, for the startup ecosystem is how do you provide access to capital? And so that's really what the fund did. So that's what NFC did. And one of the stats we're most proud of as a firm, 20 of our 37 portfolio companies are Montana-based. And for every dollar that we've paid into a Montana company, those portfolio companies have attracted $6. And I think it's like 12 cents is the ratio of outside capital. So it's not just being a check writer and being the only check writer. It's bringing the syndicates together in this ecosystem to really allow companies to survive through this early stage valley of death to get to the coasts, basically. Right. And- We've talked to a bunch of different funds that focus on tertiary places like you are, but they're usually more broad. So I'm curious, you know, you're Montana centric, but I would imagine that you also look at ideas and founders from surrounding states, I would imagine, right? Absolutely. And and so this was actually a very deliberate choice we made when we raised the second fund. So I joined the team in 2017 after the first close of our second fund, and we ended up raising a $38 million fund. And if you think about that over a three-year investment period, trying to deploy that size of a fund in seed stage Montana-based companies, I I think it would be impossible to do it responsibly. And what we're seeing is really the organic natural rate of seed stage deals in Montana. It's about one to two per year. But what that meant when we raised a $38 million fund is that we needed to start looking more regionally. And so what we decided to do very deliberately in terms of our strategy was We started building relationships in Colorado and in Utah, being very mindful of being additive to those ecosystems, not trying to go in and and compete with the existing seed stage investors, but being additive to those ecosystems and those syndicates, because in doing that, we could then leverage those relationships for uh, follow on in our portfolio and bringing those same, same relationships and investors to Montana. So fund two became... Montana primary, but then also Colorado and Utah. And now with fund three, an $80 million fund, what we're doing is we're actually looking strongly in Idaho, Boise, Coeur d'Alene, and Wyoming, Jackson, Laramie, Cheyenne, because we see those ecosystems. Idaho has a pretty established ecosystem, I would say. Not quite the same level as Utah or or even Colorado, but Wyoming almost reminds us more of Montana in 2015 than Montana. It's almost even more difficult than Montana was in 2015, despite the fact that there's some really great founders and great mentors there too. I know you touched on it briefly, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about your background is the first part to the question. The second part to the question is, since I know that you, you are a former operator, I'd personally love to know what are the top qualities that you look for in a founding team? So my journey was, I would say, if you look at my background, it doesn't make any sense as I progress through my career. But if you look at it backwards, it kind of makes sense. That's what matters. I mean, whatever. (laughs) So that's all that matters. 
Yeah, so I majored in applied math and computer science, and then the Army put those skills to good use and commissioned me as a West Point grad, but I was actually commissioned as an infantry officer, and so I spent five years on active duty, 30 months deployed as a Ranger platoon leader in Iraq and conventional deployment to Afghanistan. So I had a very on-the-ground perspective of the war, and I also served as an aide to General Stan McChrystal at Joint Special Operations Command. And where I got really excited about my academic background was when I made a decision in 2008 to get out of the Army and essentially be a product owner for an entity that was affiliated with Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And we were building predictive analytic products for the counter IED fight in Iraq. So I had this tactical knowledge and technical know-how, and I worked with some of these really big brain mathematicians that were some of the most unbelievable people I've ever met, but just didn't understand necessarily how to make that connection between the customer and, and the math. And so I cut my teeth there. We had a lot of success in that organization and then got scooped up by the Central Intelligence Agency, where I worked for three years. Once I had my fill of that bureaucracy is when I started, co-founded my first company, Red Owl Analytics, which was really focused on how do you characterize human behavior from a event basis, purely looking at events that are happening, whether it's an email, a phone call, enter and exit of a building, printer activity. How do you characterize human behavior? And then how do you identify anomalies? Think of it as sort of the tool that would have caught Edward Snowden had we invented it a few years earlier. And what was the genesis to to you coming up with that? Or co-founding that? One of my co-founders, Guy Filippelli, was uh, a good friend. And, and we had talked about working together prior to that. But this opportunity really came about as a result of research that Josh Lospinoza, who was getting his PhD at, uh, at Oxford and studying under one of the mirror network scientists in the world, it was an algorithm that Josh had developed. And what was really special about it, and it's kind of funny, I mean, this is only like a little over 10 years ago, but it was an algorithm that didn't scale. But if it could scale... It had this unbelievable predictive capability. And Guy had this idea talking to Josh. He said, well, maybe we can use this new thing called Hadoop and we can parallelize the algorithm and then the compute would scale. I was like, this sounds pretty cool and sounds like it'd be a fun project to work on. And sure enough, that's kind of what we did in early days. So that was the Genesis story. And then Rennie McPherson, who was our other co-founder, joined shortly after that and really helped us solidify our go-to-market and our strategy and sales efforts. So it was quite a fun genesis, but it was about a three-year ride that seemed like a decade. (laughs) It was was exhausting. It was tiring. Yeah. What are some of the biggest lessons that you learned from that experience? And especially how you translate that into being on the flip side of the coin now as an investor? Being a startup founder is a very, it's a specific calling, I think more so than just about any other career out there. I mean, you really have to understand what you're signing up for on multiple levels. It's a grind. I mean, you are working 24 seven. It's a marriage. You are married to the people that you work with. And I I think ultimately your ability to be successful, if you hold everything else constant, or or not constant, but if you check all the right boxes on like timing is great and technology was great, if everything else is great, ultimately what it comes back to is is people and relationships and drive. I mean, that is the crux of being successful as an early stage tech founder. So it's something that I pay a lot of particular attention to is the founders and who they are and what their story is. That's another thing. The origination story, both from the perspective of how did these founders meet, what's their relationship like, but also what's the origin story for what they're building and what's the passion behind what they're doing, to me, is more important than anything. Speaking to that, is there an example of a portfolio company that could illustrate that point? Maybe you can tell us their story. My most recent investment that I I led is in a company called Bandwango. It's a SaaS solution for destination marketing organizations to help both the little guys in and the big cities promote experiences on a very local level. And it provides a platform that otherwise most cities and and small, especially smaller metropolitan areas would not be able to leverage a technical solution to serve tourists and customers. So it's a really slick platform. Mo Parikh, the founder, classically, he was a, I think he was studying, it was bioinformatics or something extremely technical. He was getting his PhD at Rutgers but he's a super passionate, uber passionate snowboarder. And he had this idea to build a snowboarding app. Of course, right? Like, right. 
<laughs> in Montana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he would come out, he was living in New Jersey, but he would come out to ski in Utah. And what he wanted to do was digitize the process of getting a lift ticket at a resort. And so he built this mobile app and it was kind of silly and clunky and didn't really work. And it's like, how many other snowboarders have tried to do the same thing? But what, it, what he ended up discovering, he got so passionate about the opportunity and just obsessed about making this happen. He ended up leaving his PhD program. He took it on full time and it was through the discovery and wanting to make this work and happen that he discovered there was a business opportunity that was much more significant than just the ski resorts. And it was just by obsessing over the problem and talking to customers. And what they told him is we don't have a problem selling lift tickets, but what we really wish we could figure out is how to sell the full experience, the hotels, the drinks, what you do the day you're not skiing. How do we package all that? And that became the informed product vision that led to him figuring out his product market fit. And I mean, you talk about a business that you would expect to die on the vine during COVID. They had 100% year over year growth during COVID. Wow. Selling to the tourism industry. That's counterintuitive. Is that because people were traveling to outside of the big cities and so they were looking for information? Somewhat, yeah, it is counterintuitive. And what we found out as we dug into looking at the opportunity is number one, it was one of the ways that tourism bureaus and destination marketing organizations could continue to promote experiences Mm -hmm. that were socially distanced, right? So you could put together experiences and even fundraisers, like imagine an organization wanting to do a fundraiser at a winery or something. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't have a hundred people gather at the winery but you could sell a pass or a ticket to the fundraiser and then individual families or whoever can go to the winery based on the schedule of when they bought the ticket. So it was a really unique way of distributing things that typically involve gathering and promoting tourism at a time where it was hard to do it in other ways. So. Interesting. You're obviously geographically focused and being geographically focused, you want to be very broad, I would imagine, in the types mm -hmm. of companies that you want to fund. That means that you have to be a generalist. So are there themes that are coming up in the areas in which you invest? How has COVID accelerated maybe some of these opportunities? for you? There certainly are themes. And I would say, to take it one step further, there's definitely themes in our portfolio, I think, that have emerged around, as a partnership, just some of the business or industries that we're more comfortable in. I mean, obviously, if there's a cybersecurity deal that comes through our firm, I'm probably going to be the partner to take right. a look at it, right? We have focused a lot with our third fund on B2B SaaS, especially enterprise SaaS solutions that involve workforce optimization, remote team management, those sorts of themes. And, and uh, you know, those are hot for everybody. That's no secret, right? But I think we've all come to realize that the new normal is the future of, of work. And so those sorts of platforms certainly are interesting to us. But, you know, historically, data analytics, Anything that has some sort of AI or machine learning component, our partner, Rich Hargis, who has a background in that. And so he's definitely has an affinity for those types of deals, IoT, predictive analytics, that sort of thing. And then we just hired a new operating partner who, I mean, he was unbelievable background. He was a test pilot in the Navy. He's flown just about everything out there. Highly technical background. He was a VP of engineering at Rigetti Computing, which is quantum computing, Andreessen Horowitz portfolio company. So super deep technically. And his, his undergrad, I mean, he's a physics undergrad, big brain. So we also have this affinity for deep tech deals as well, especially, and I would say, especially dual use defense technology, because of my background, things I did at, at CIA and knowledge of stuff across the National Security Agency and National Geospatial Agency. I have a lot of exposure to needs, capabilities. I have a lot of network there. So Dual use defense tech and deep tech is also an area of, I would say, specificity for our fund. Have you noticed an influx of founders that are coming to Montana over the past year and a half? So basically COVID era, <laughs> yeah. coming from New York and California, <laughs> well, just leaving in droves. What have you seen? Yeah. Jenny, it's almost like you teed that one up for me because it's, it's actually <laughs> a great little vignette. So I can't tell you how many founders, how many inbound, both, both founders and, and just in general, like amazing technical people that inbounded me over the past 18 months, 24 months. And it got to be so exciting that we actually launched a Slack workspace for Bozeman. It's called the Bozeman Stack. And we started out by just inviting 40 local tech people that we knew, leaders in the industry, CEOs and, and tech leaders. 
There's now, last time I checked, this was probably six months ago, there's over 250 people in the channel. It's an open channel. I don't even know probably 60 to 70% of them face-to-face because they're new. (laughs) Right. But you talk about, I mean, you name a Silicon Valley unicorn, there's at least one or two from every single one of those companies that I feel like live in Bozeman now. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And then it gets really special when... I had a call. I'll always take a call from any founder or anybody that's interested in relocating or moving to Montana and just wants to learn about the ecosystem. And one such call was a founder named Kike Nagel, who had started a company called Advisor.io in New York City, had raised a seed round and said, hey, I'm thinking about moving out to Montana and bringing my company with me. Would you guys be interested in investing? And I said, Kiki, I I get that a lot. We get that all the time. I'd love to take a look. I'd love to learn about your company. But until you move out here, I I, I don't, it's a regional thesis. Right. Sure enough, during COVID, he calls me, he said, hey, I'm here. I moved out here. (laughs) I met with him and and we ended up investing. Uh, We ended up investing in advisor. And so now, I mean, he's, he's one of my dearest new friends and it's fun. Well, you guys have the coolest team photo on your website. which is like the three of you fishing in this amazing, I don't know if that's a river or a lake and a huge fish. <laughs> and, you know, you look at that and you're like, yeah, I want to go there. Exactly. We need to update that. <laughs> we definitely need to update. That's from when there was only three of us. We need to, we certainly need to get all six of us in the new team photo, but you know, yeah. I'm sure we can find another fish. For yeah. Sure. If yes, one was yeah. to be a tourist in Bozeman, what would one do? I actually, <laughs> it's kind of going to be a, a little bit of a cheeky answer, but I would say find a local and have the local take you somewhere. No, but there's so many special hikes. I, I think no matter what the time of year and no matter what your physical ability or capability, you can always hike. I mean, you may need, need snowshoes at certain times of the year, but I mean, right. there's just so much beautiful outdoors to see. And especially in the summertime, there's hikes of all different ability levels, but finding one that's right for you and enjoying the view and the space and just the people, you know, that's one, that's another thing about Montana that I love is generally the outdoors are unforgiving. I mean, there's times a year where it can be life-threatening. And so generally people, especially people that live here, like you help one another out. If somebody's car is broken on the side of the road in the wintertime, you stop because you would expect the same of of someone else. So it's generally a a really friendly and helpful community. So even if if you're new to town or you don't know where to go, just ask. I'm sure you'll get more of an earful than you wanted. (laughs) How do you get, uh, because obviously you help start companies Mm -hmm. and all that. How do you get outside capital from the coast to come in and help those companies grow and Mm -hmm. get to the next level? Yeah. So I think the first consideration is really understanding how that environment changes and is evolving over time. There's always, since I hit the road, it did Sand Hill Road in 2012, there's never a lack of capital out there at any stage. I think the most important thing that we've done or that we continue to do is educating our portfolio founders, how that environment is changing and how the circumstances and the metrics and the thresholds and the hurdles and everything is it's constantly evolving. I mean, even the sizes of rounds, if you asked me last week versus this week, it changes. And so Mm -hmm. keeping up on that is a very important part of what we do because we have to make sure that our companies, when we make an investment, that that's sufficient runway and that we have a sufficient line of sight to getting those companies to the the thresholds where either a regional next series VC or a coastal VC will be in a position to, and and it'll it'll be the right stage for them to lead that financing. Because the worst thing you can do is, I think in a regional fund or outside of the coastal ecosystem is you fund a company into tweener land where they're too big for the previous stage and they're too small for the next stage. And it's like, what do you do for the tweeners? And, And it's actually become part of our strategy as well, because it happens. We try not to do it, (laughs) but we see it does happen with other people. And that's, you know, especially like in Utah, that's where we've tried to be additive to the ecosystem because there's amazing founders that have great growth trajectory, great businesses, great time. Everything's right. They just find themselves in the tweener stage. And so we've funded, I've led a few of those deals. So now we're going to flip to our four standard question segment, and we're looking forward to hearing your answers. Our first, <laughs> our, these are going to be good. I can tell you're laughing already. I love it. Um, <laughs> our first question is the NVCA question. The National Venture Capital Association advocates for public policy that supports the venture community and the American entrepreneurial ecosystem. If there was one thing that you'd change about the VC industry or one policy that you would advocate for, what would it be? I can only pick one, huh? 
<laughs> do, you can do pick we as have, many as you want. <laughs> okay. Do we have like a two hour long of, podcast? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I'll say one. There's obviously always in any regulatory environment, like you ask one side of the aisle versus the other side. Like I want this would be great for me. This would be great. What I would, what I'm going to suggest more generally is a change that I think would be not necessarily great for VCs, not necessarily great for founders, but great for, I would say, everybody else. And that is, if you look at this country and the widening gap between the mega rich and everyone else, what disappoints me is that venture as an asset class is not readily available to the majority. And especially folks that are below the accredited investor threshold. So whether it's the definition of accredited investor, you talk about the 99 investor limit, you think about some of this policy and the reg D exemption, it's from the eighties. And I know they updated it in 2020. I wish there was something we could do to democratize everyone's access to venture as an asset class. And not that, not that I would advocate that my mom put her entire retirement into a venture fund, but why can't she have put the same 5% of her net worth into a fund that an accredited investor can, Right. you know? Yep. Is I'm sure you guys never get that. <laughs> no one ever says that. Well, right? understandably, I mean, it's common for a reason, right? So number two is if you were not a VC and money wasn't a concern, what career would you have? So, <laughs> so when I was transitioning from the army, I took a, it was like a strengths finder or something like that. Like, what should you be when you grow up kind of thing, whatever that survey, I forget what it was. What and, color uh, is your parachute? I've read that. Oh yeah. I've read that book. <laughs> uh, I think it was version 20.2 yeah. or whatever, but yeah. I took the survey and it said number one choice, non-commissioned officer in the military. I'm like, what? And then no, no, number two, commissioned officer. And I'm like, I'm, I'm ruined. There's nothing for me. Number three was secondary education teacher. I love teaching. And I even had, there's one point in my career where I think it was actually after I left Red Owl and I thought about starting I mean, similar to what Scott Galloway's done, like section four and some of that innovation around education. I thought about starting like a major league teaching thing, like app or something. And I, I love teaching, but I would uh, more than anything, I think if I were doing anything else other than venture, I would want to figure out a way to just re-energize and reinvent the education system in this country. So I don't know if that means being secretary of education. I don't know if that means just starting my own unschool, getting into the public school system. I don't know. I don't know what it'd be, but it would have to do with teaching, I think. And if you could teach one course, what would it be? Well, definitely mathematics or physics. I love physics too, because it's much more concrete applications of math. And yep. I just think there's so much you can teach with math. One of the greatest kind of inspirations of my entire life was my high school math teacher, Mrs. Joanne Mullen. And I think about, I learned so much more from her than just math. She was a really, really special, special woman. And I'm just thankful for her. So I'm sure she'd be very happy to hear you say that. Number three, who is someone that you look up to and why? So throughout my life, I've had a lot of mentors of different flavor, different variety. One of the most active mentors in my life right now is, is a gentleman named Mort Meyerson. Un unbelievable background. I think most people would maybe haven't heard of him, but I mean, he was the CEO of EDS. He was the CTO at General Motors. Unbelievable professional background. You meet the man and you would never in a you know, hundred hours of just talking to him guess any of that because of just how grounded and humble he is. But what I admire most about him and why I spend time with him regularly I've never met someone in my life that listens as well as he does. He's just the most unbelievable listener. And a lot of times I surprise myself or he surprises me with just the most sage and sound advice. He's almost like a Yoda. But what, I, what I've realized in spending time with him and interacting with him, it's because of how good he is at listening that he's able to just seem clairvoyant sometimes. It's pretty magical. Right, well, that's amazing. Yeah. Number four, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? So I thought, I've been thinking a lot about this one, and I think I'm going to have to go with a short quote from Ray Dalio's Principles, where mm -hmm. he talks about struggling well. And I think about so many of the major themes in my life or some of the advice that I've received, and it all kind of goes back to that because... I think the reality is hardship and struggle in life. If you get to know people and you realize that it's something that we all, it's part of the human condition. We all struggle. And I think struggling well is the way that you build empathy. Kind of one of my other favorite pieces of advice is related to luck. 
which is defined as the, the intersection of persistence and opportunity. It's like struggling is all about persistence, right? It's about making it through hard times. And then that's what ultimately presents opportunities to take advantage of. And, and I think when people that are committed to the struggle and the constant struggle and ultimately are live happier or what people perceive as like, oh, well, they're successful. And it's like, well, nobody's made like even once you make it you know even once you seem to be successful you're still going to struggle right like you still have to earn it every day it's hard and so i think that's something that kind of always keeps me going when i realize yeah it's hard again and again and again so. uh, that's that's good advice and i remember a quote that one of the partners early partners at sequoia said and you know somebody was asking how do you guys do it be, be so successful he goes like because we always work because as paranoid that we're going to go out of business. <laughs> right. So, yeah. yeah. I think venture too is the epitome of that business, right? I mean, you have to earn it. Every fund, every investment, every relationship with every founder, you can't take any of it for granted. It's constant, but that's the difference. That's the difference between a firm that raises one fund and is done and a firm that has legacy and has an amazing track record of helping and supporting successful founders. Great. Les, thank you very much for joining us today. We appreciate your time and enjoyed learning about the Montana venture ecosystem. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And follow us on Twitter at ProofVC or on our website at proof.vc. Thank you.